Hey, welcome everyone. This is Ray here. We've got a great talk tonight. Um, we have our um, co-host, as always, Scott Keyes. Oops, just lost my screen here. Hang on. Um, and we also have our guest tonight, uh, Karam Khan, um, who's a great Hi. photographer. He's done a lot more traveling than either one of us, so you're going to get to see a lot more variety here, which is really good. And, um, you know, we're going to kind of just get right into it here. Uh, we're going to talk about different ways of approaching different wildlife, and um, there's there's a lot of different techniques, obviously, and we I think we all kind of get this question a lot from different people because uh, we've been doing this a long time and we've kind of learned different ways, and especially beginners, it's kind of one of the hardest things to get your hand on, uh, get a get a handle on, I should say, um, is how do you actually get close to make some of these great different images um, that you see online all the time. Uh, so that's definitely what we want to talk about. And uh, one thing I do want to mention right off, the, right off the bat is, you know, getting close to wildlife doesn't always mean filling the frame. Um, it just means getting within range to make a nice, unique photo. Um, you know, some of you that follow me may know I like to try and include a little bit more habitat in my photos and uh, some of these guys tonight are going to be sharing some of the same kind of thing. So it doesn't always mean getting close and get, or I should say, it doesn't always mean getting as close as possible. It just means getting in a good position to make a good photo. Uh, so to start out, yeah. um, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I just wanted to, to chime in. I think the, the, the key that you'll probably see in all the photos, because I've had a chance to look through um, some of this stuff and I, I've, you know, I'm real close with both Kerm and Ray. But one of the things that you'll see is, um, the common theme is whether you're filling the frame or you're including a lot of habitat is it's really just making the, the subject look natural. And so I think that one of the things that these guys both do a really great job is, is putting themselves in position to get really natural looking images. So yeah, I just wanted to throw that in. Right yeah, that's perfect. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Karam and uh, he's going to do a little bit of talking about mammals, which is definitely a different kind of ball game than birds. Um, so uh, Karam, if you want to take it away, that's a great image of the moose you can start with there. All right. Good evening, guys. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Ray and Scott. Thanks for having me. Uh, like, uh, and I'm gonna basically confirm what Ray and Scott just said. Uh, approach to wildlife doesn't mean getting close to wildlife. Uh, you should have an image that you want to create, and then you can try to approach. But a better image is not necessarily a frame filling image. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, let's jump right into this. Uh, Whenever you want to photograph wildlife, there are two things, right? You either approach them or they approach you. I don't think there's any other way. Uh, there's a lot of wrong ways of approaching wildlife. I don't think there's any right way of approaching wildlife. You know, great point. Same methods, same methods work for uh, different species. Sometimes different individuals in the same species need to be approached differently. So a lot of this depends on what you're going to photograph, you know, if you know the individuals that you're going to photograph, are they used to human presence, what the environment is, but, you know, having having said that, we're going to go over certain points and go over a few images, um, and so I'll start with mammals here. Uh, it is definitely easy to approach mammals during the rut. Uh, yeah. Moose are formidable uh, animals. You know, this particular individual was not a very tamed one. Uh, we happened to, we didn't even see him. We saw a young moose actually going off into the sage, and it was pretty white out conditions. And we followed that guy, and we got close to this moose who was actually with a female, and the other moose was obviously during the run trying to mate with the female. Uh, moose are eight feet tall. They weigh close to 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. So if they trample you, you're going to die. Uh, when do you approach? So during the rut, the moose doesn't don't really care. I was able to get close. This was shot pretty much full frame, but this was shot with a 600 and a 1.4 teleconverter. Uh, I had enough distance that the moose was comfortable. And at one point, I did get a little close, and he stopped paying attention to his female, the contender, and started paying attention to me, and that was time for me to back off. Yeah. You know, this was not in a blind. Uh, this could not be in a blind because they were moving around because he was being harassed by the young males. And he was actually going towards the other male. That's when we got the shot. 
again, learn to read body languages, especially these big mammals, because they can hurt you. That's a great point that you just said, and um, I think that kind of applies to all approaching of wildlife. Uh, probably one of the second most important things, other than learning the species, is paying attention to their behavior. And that is certainly something that comes with time and experience in the field with these different animals, whatever they may be. You start to learn different, you know, quirks and things that they do that kind of mean different things, and you can react accordingly. Yeah, I mean, this was, you know, the, they were busy with their rocks, and the moment you realize that they're not paying attention to the other uh, animals and to you, it's time to back away. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next image here. Nice. Uh, bison, they're even bigger than most, <laughs> you know, all over Yellowstone. And this was sort of a mini stampede coming over the hill. And but the males were actually what they do is they guard the females. The way they do is they never leave the herd because for them safety is in numbers. You know, as big as they are, uh, they basically keep, you know, stick to their herd. And the way they protect their female is they form a barrier between the female and the other males in the herd. So you know they're not going to pay attention to you. And as they were coming along we set up on the side of the road in Lamar Valley and you know you realize these animals coming and you know they're not going to be there they're used to humans there they will and they were going to cross the road and go onto the other side and you just set it up you don't have to chase them you don't have to run after them and you let them do their crossing and you just find a position and you photograph them head on and you know you can try different compositions at that time Again, if you run after moose, uh, after bison, I'm sorry, chances are you're going to get tossed around like a rag. Dog. Yeah, not a good idea. So, you know, and they are, you know, always have an escape plan. That's what I always do when photographing big animals. Okay, if I do get charged, how am I saving myself? You know, people go out and without a plan, that is not advisable, not with animals of this size. You know, luckily for them, there was a big boulder behind me that was easy for humans to climb, but not for these guys. So that was a contingency in case I did get charged. Nice. Uh, also, as far as wildlife is concerned, this is a wild western coyote out of Yellowstone. Uh, you have to pay attention to, you know, these animals. These people, obviously, these animals obviously have been fed over the years. Uh, wherever they see people walk, and this was an area where people walk on the side of the road photographing wolves, the coyotes were pretty close. Uh, partly because I think being close to humans would provide them protection as the wolves tend to stay away. But I, I realized, you know, where this guy was lurking and just kind of set up, sit, again, no blind needed, no stalking needed, nothing. You wait and you photograph. Uh, sometimes you find tame animals in the wildest of places. Sure. And this is an example for that. Uh, you know, again, full frame because the animal approached me rather than me approaching the animal. So would you say more uh, often with mammals you let them approach you than actually go after them? Uh, mostly depends, but, you know, I, I was going to talk about that in the other image. Okay. Uh, I, I guess I can answer that. The next thing, you know, the, the most, one of the most common and widely spread mammal in the United States is the deer, the white tail on the east coast, and uh, you know the mule deer is on the west coast. For the most part, they are skittish, and you can get within half a mile of these guys. But come rut, you know, they're easily accessible. But even during the rut, you can't, you know, it's very unlikely that the deer is going to come to you. The deer is not interested in me. The deer is interested in the female. So he and the woman, females are generally, the does are running away. And for those, you got to, you know, set up a, think of the image that you want to get. And you end up, for the most part, going after them. Or you set up and you see them chasing the female and you get your shot. And if you want more shot, for those, you're going to have to get close. Uh, you know, some of the deer in New Jersey are more tolerant to people uh, because there's just more people in New Jersey, which is where Ray and I are from. Uh, and, you know, it's easy to approach these animals as compared to some of the other places where I've tried to photograph them. 
Uh, but for the rut and deer, chances are you're going to have to approach them. Uh, you know, you got to pay attention to the wind. Uh, it is yeah. always better if you are downwind. Uh, pay attention to, uh, you know, the uh, sun direction. Pay attention to the noise because, you know, they're, the time when people go out to photograph them is generally during the fall, and, you know, there's still a lot of leaf on the ground. So you want to make sure you're not making a lot of noise. That doesn't help. Be quiet. Try to stay downwind. And you can slowly approach them and at least get to where you want to get them. Again, you don't have to fill the frame to make the most amazing pictures. Uh, this was again shot, I think, uh, on a 400 millimeter with a 2x cell converter. So, and then cropped some for an overall shot. So, for deer, again, you know, you can pretty much would have to approach them. People put out food and have the deer come to them, but you know, those are not the shots. They they don't they're never that uh, appealing, and they never make for good uh, wildlife photography images, in my opinion. You know, everybody's yeah, I don't have an opinion, but that's generally what this is about. A uh, a question came in for you, uh, Karam. Uh, have you ever photographed grizzlies? I have at Yellowstone, but those were you know most of the grizzlies that people photograph are either uh, up in Alaska in Lake Clark, which are run. Uh, you know, run workshops where you have a guide who basically controls the situation. And up in Katmai, uh, one of them is from a top, you know from a little deck, which you're kind of on the safety of a deck, and the bear are kind of in the streams and on the waterfall. Everybody's seen that famous waterfall image of a grizzly yeah. trying to close its paws on a salmon. Uh, and most of the other situations are also controlled because they always have a guide, sometimes with or without guns. The grizzlies that I've photographed are inland grizzlies, and you know the grizzly was so afraid of us, as opposed to you know I mean it was my first time so I was a little intimidated, but that animal was more scared of me than I was of him. And if you let them be, you know they will avoid you. It's only when you surprise a grizzly mom with cubs is when you get into trouble. Sure. Um, yeah, and then we did have a question that came in about guides, and it was something I was also curious about, Kerm. So the, the images you've you've kind of shared outside the deer, um, just maybe talk about how helpful the guide was, and also with the animal behavior. You know, you mentioned some different behavior, and and was it helpful having somebody who kind of lives there and knows the animals? Um, in in specific. Obviously, no doubt. You know, uh, somebody who knows the animals knows the area. Uh, the images I've shared so far, uh, especially for Yellowstone, I, I, we didn't have a guide. Uh, I did my research. Uh, I reached out to a couple of friends online, you know, find out what the places are, and spoke to them about it. But they were basically done without a guide, you know, kind of look for them on our own in Yellowstone. I was with a friend. Uh, I don't recommend that you do Yellowstone by yourself. I always recommend that you go with a friend. I was with a friend, uh, and we kind of just went from area to area to area. And you'll be surprised. Uh, you would think that once you're in Yellowstone, you're out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it can get pretty kind of English. Uh, you know, I don't know if people get that or not. <laughs> you know, I mean, the moment there's a grizzly uh, sighting, there's just a crowd. Yeah, I, I've seen the one grizzly that I saw. The reason it was scared was there were like probably ten cars with ten photographers lined up. You're not allowed to go off road uh, everywhere. And there are uh, mostly rangers that monitor the situation because they know where these bears are moving. So, you know, it's only when you're on lands where you can go inside deep into the countries when you get into trouble. And, and again, for, even for bears, you know, you can keep a fair amount of distance. They will not bother with you. It's when you surprise a mom with cubs is when you run into trouble. And, you know, we did run into a black bear with cubs, uh, but luckily for us, and she was not happy, but we were in a car, so she had no choice. She ran away. Yeah. But, you know, guides definitely, I mean, they do help. Uh, you don't have to have, you know, uh, do big, uh, you know, expensive guides. There are pl plenty of local stuff. And, but in my opinion, you know, Yellowstone and uh, these places, if you're going to stay on the regular pathway, you don't really need to have a guide, uh, especially during the winter, because it's there are only very few places that you can go to. Yeah, and real quick, Haley asks if you have uh, any stories of 
being charged or animals getting aggressive, and I just kind of mentioned to her to stay tuned until the end because I think you had one yeah. kind of uh, yeah. set up for so, that. Uh, yeah. So moving on. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. This is, again, uh, you know, uh, this is one of those where the animal, this was the main elf uh, who was control, controlling the entire harem. And for a little bit, you know, you realize, okay, I'm a little too close. Again, this is shot um, uh, almost with complete darkness. Uh, and this is the, uh, you know, the main, there was a bull elf that was controlling the females. And for a while, he, you know, we walked closer, we got into position. It, it was, again, still, this is crop. Uh, this was shot with uh, 600 with a 1.4 teleconverter, and then maybe crop 10 to 15%. So he was a, just, and these are big animals. So, you know, but he paid attention for a while, but then after that, we didn't get closer. Uh, he got busy with controlling his females and we were able to make, you know, wonderful shots. Again, for these guys, uh, the best is keep your distance, let them do their thing, and you photograph them. After a while, if you don't cross into, you know, I, I have read this on uh, one of the big wildlife journals, or maybe on a Nat Geo show, where this uh, some wildlife photographer, you know, much more accomplished, uh, and uh, was talking about the animals have uh, two circles. He talked about the outer circle is when they start noticing when you get in that, and when you get into the inner circle, that's where the problem starts, and you want to be between the outside the inner circle and you know in between the outer circle. That's where you can get decent shots, and I think for the most part we did the same with elk. Again, with elk, as long as you keep your distance, they will stay away from you. Yeah, and uh, I'm just going to hop back to my screen real quick just to touch on a whitetail shot real quick, just like you were mentioning previously. Mm -hmm. um, here's one I shot at a park where the deer are super habituated to people. It was during the rut, so again, these bucks weren't caring about anybody. And uh, this was shot pretty much full frame. I barely cropped this. And if this deer took probably two more steps towards me, I was getting ready to hide behind a tree. Uh, but thankfully, there was other deer in the area. He kind of just, uh, I was really paying attention to body language. Um, I just watched him uh, kind of look at me. He threw his nose up in the air, uh, sniffed around a little bit, and then just turned around and walked calmly away. So, uh, you know, I didn't make any sudden movements. I wasn't moving towards him. I had walked into their space, but then he had walked this close to me. So, uh, you know, depending on the area and kind of those circles that uh, Karam was just talking about, uh, some of them can be closer depending on the habitat. This was kind of a little bit denser forest and less uh, of an open field uh, compared to the example he was just showing. Um, so different habitats and different deer can allow you to, to approach different distances. So back to you, Karam. Yeah, again, uh, that's a beautiful shot, Ray. Again, same thing that we mentioned before. Same technique may not work with the same species yep. or it may not work with you know with the same animal on different days uh but in any event uh we'll move on uh so when you do get close to wildlife first of all you know when you're trying to photograph wildlife try to utilize some of those areas which have wildlife which are habituated to humans sorry about that pop-up that came up uh but you know getting close to wildlife doesn't necessarily mean zooming in on the eyelashes i mean you can do that those are great shots but when you do get close to them, you can actually, if you are lucky, try to include more in the image. Yeah. And, you know, you can include the entire animal, and I think that makes for a better picture overall. You know, if you can photograph wildlife with a wide-angle lens, that's the best. Find out, you know, there are always areas, refuge, which have animals that are basically, you know, habituated to human, and you're, uh, you're able to get close. You know, this... This uh, fox was looking for hands out, handouts, which he'd never got, and he was turning around and walking away. And I was able to get these frames almost uh, at 24 millimeters, and I didn't approach it. I was actually just sitting on the beach uh, looking for snowy owls, and that's when this happened. Uh, again, knowing your local places helps a lot, uh, and it can allow you to get close to wildlife that is uh, habituated and you know, used to people. Yeah, that's a perfect example of it right there. Yeah. Uh, again, same point. Uh, you know, approach to wildlife doesn't necessarily mean getting closer to wildlife. You can shoot the animal in its environment, uh, show them uh, where they live, you know, show your photograph, through your photograph, show people where they live, you know. 
this bull elk was not interested. He was going after females and we were just standing there kind of hiding behind the brush that you can see in the foreground and photographing them over the top. And, you know, he just kept going and we kept creating these images. That's a killer scene. Um, yeah. And it, it was trying to, thanks, Rick, trying to include more of the scene again. Like, you know, you don't have to zoom in. I mean, I could have zoomed in with a bigger telephoto, but I thought it made for a better picture this way than it did with, you know, with the telephoto. Whatever. Yeah, I would agree. Um, we do have another yeah. question that just came in here. Al Brown asks, are there certain behavioral movements that these mammals exhibit that will tip you off to say capturing a great action shot? And um, I would say definitely, you know, uh, most mammals, um, when they're relaxed, even if they're aware of you, they're going to be grazing. That's kind of what they do. If they're awake, they're looking to eat unless it's during the rut, uh, which a lot of these examples have been, in which case um, they're already kind of doing what they're doing. You know, uh, they're really going to be ignoring you a lot more. Um, so I would say, you know, if you're hanging around some wildlife, uh, some mammals, and they are kind of relaxed and grazing and eating, and then all of a sudden something changes in that behavior, that's an, a big indication that something may happen, whether they're going to run from something scared or uh, interact with each other, you know, uh, but other than that, um, you know, just kind of watch the body language, just like you would with a, a person, you know, it's really no different. Um, you can kind of start to pick up on specific things that happen, uh, just changes in the behavior from a relaxed state to a more um, uh, tense state, and uh, that can translate into some action photos if that's specifically what you're looking for. Oh, absolutely. I think, Ray, you couldn't have said it better. You, you pay attention, you will basically learn that even different individuals have their own kind of behavior that tips you off as to what's going to happen. Again, white-tailed deer, you know, you don't have to get close to get a better picture. And when there's rut, they will go after the females. We saw this guy following the female. We were set up based on where we thought he was going to be. And, you know, we turned out we were a little further away than we wanted to be, but I, I, I didn't mind this image. And he kept chasing the female. And I think out of the whole sequence, one of our other friends, Josh Galicki, got a great shot of the white tail rubbing his uh, one of the branches so that would be you know when you know what to expect that's the typical rut behavior you yeah. know that's going to happen yep. yeah and i would also uh, say to anyone real quick that's uh interested that hasn't photographed white-tailed deer before and you're thinking about giving it a shot uh, concentrate more on the does go out in Octo like late october november at least in the northeast uh, I'm not sure of the rut times in other areas, uh, but find out the local rut time uh, when the bucks are really going after the does. And, and it's actually almost easier to concentrate on the does and the bucks will come to them. Uh, so just a tip there. Yeah, and, and, and you know, some animals require blinds, you know, uh, the, the same species, the iguana, if you find them in Florida, you could probably pet them. Yeah. Uh, this is Costa Rica and they would see you and they would just run away. Oh, no kidding. And, and, Yep. Well, they were extremely skittish. Oh, wow. And I, you know, photograph one because they were breeding and they had this beautiful orange color. Yeah, that was and, really you know, neat. The problem was they were all high up in the canopy. So you, what do you do? You sit in your car, you drive to the top of the mountain, <laughs> and you find them, and you photograph them. And you know, the other side was a river probably, I would say, 1,000 meters down, which is where this guy was. Nice. Uh, but, you know, we, I was able to get close to him purely by just shooting out of the car window. You know, cars are amazing blinds. They certainly can be. Uh, oh, and you know, it's for birds, for mammals, you know, where you can use them. Uh, we'll have a few more examples yep. later in the talk. Uh, but that's one. Uh, this was shot up in uh, Barrow, and, and, and as Scott Keyes had mentioned before, you know, guides help. This was definitely, this is an area I do not recommend going without a guide, you know, at least for the first time. And he showed us, and he showed us the basic lay of the land there, where the animals were, and some he put us some of the birds he put us on, and some we found on our own. And again, this you know, this was basically we crept up to this guy, kind of behind some uh, you know piles of ice, and at the last moment, kind of stuck our lenses over the ice and got this image. Nice. You know, duck. In my opinion, uh, if they see you, they're gone. Yeah. Uh, just there's no better way you know you can photograph them from a distance 
but most of the time that's what you're going to get are you know ducks flying away yep. ducks swimming away with kind of these ass shots and the you know the skittish duck looking over her shoulder Correct. Uh, as she swims away because she's scared if you're coming after it or not and and people get like oh that's such a great shot no nah, not really you know you are I, I don't sign to be don't you know want to be cocky but basically what you're just showing there is ducks afraid of you and swimming away so for ducks i highly recommend using a blind and, and a stealth approach ray and i actually shot uh ducks you know a while back and we actually got to them even before sunrise yep and you know the whole couple of hours we were in a blind you know that we were there so ducks always work that way better yeah here's so this the... is an example of that yeah perfect you know this is ray you remember this day yes i do yeah, and, you know, we were in a blind for a couple of hours. Uh, unfortunately, the light didn't help, but, you know, these ducks showed up and did behavior that I don't think otherwise we would have been able to capture. Correct. Yeah, I mean, I think we had them on the pond in front of us for, what, probably a solid hour and a half or so? Yeah. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah, I think so, before everything happened. Yeah, and I'm just going to pop right back here real quick to my screen and show you guys here's some more on that same pond. These were different times, but same exact scenario, um, all taken in a blind. And you can see, just like uh, Karam was mentioning, uh, they're not swimming away. They're not looking scared. Uh, they're just kind of doing their thing. Uh, wait, here's one more I think I have. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, I'm Just kind of swimming. While you're pulling that up. While you're pulling that up, just um, you know, I, I saw a comment from Josh because I knew he would he would jump in on this. Uh, I think it's a, a huge challenge to get these ducks when you're in a blind. It's kind of fun to me to to sit around and wait and and be a little stealthy. I know that might that might sound odd to other people. Um, I think Josh's point is that there are spots that you can get these habituated ducks as well, where there you know there's a lot of people around city parks sometimes um, where where you might not need to do that. But I I just I enjoy the process, um, and, and Ray and I have both been doing a little bit more where we get in the water and, and try to get low and, and eye level. And we've had, I mean, we've had wild ducks, not tame ducks, but wild ducks literally swim right in front of your camera inside minimal focus. Um, they're, they're much more alert to movement, so you do have to wait. Um, you don't want to be jumpy when you're in a blind. They'll come eventually as close as you need them to come but they're very attuned to movement. So even if you're in the water and you're just turning your lens, that'll pique their curiosity. And as soon as they notice movement, they tend to turn around and start, they might not fly off, but they'll drift away. And now, like Kerm said, those shots of anything going away from you always give the impression that you've scared it or you're moving it away. Whereas anything coming to you is just extremely engaging. So. Just wanted to throw that in. Yeah, totally agree. And uh, while t while Scott was saying that, the photos I was just scrolling through were all from uh, Cambridge, Maryland, where they're very habituated ducks. So that's a great example of a place where you don't need to sit around and wait for hours with uh, you know in a blind or anything like that. Um, you just kind of walk up and shoot them. Uh, but you know both methods work in different areas. No, absolutely. Uh, Cambridge, Maryland was is a prime example of that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about ducks, uh, especially ducks, at least in my opinion, during the breeding season, you want to pay attention to the female. Uh, if the female is comfortable by your presence, the male will not leave. The moment the female is bothered, the male will, she leaves, the male will go. And it was almost a tip that, you know, once in a while you get close to a bird, uh, a king eider and you saw the female king eider take off you know that the male is going to take off any moment because he's not going to stay away from the female if the female stays the males will stay and, and that's just you know just a tip to photograph birds you know i don't know if other species do it but uh eiders for example definitely did it if the female was comfortable she stayed the male stayed that allowed for you to get a closer approach yeah it's a gorgeous shot thanks Trey. uh some bush birds, you know, some songbirds, uh, songbirds, you know, all of us love songbirds, uh, some more than others, uh, you know, and, uh, but this was, uh, it, and they are hard for, for the very long time. I had a hard time getting close to them. I did not like shots shooting up uh, on a gray sky and, you know, then finally you figured out, okay, what do you do? I mean, this is one of those where this is a Tennessee wobbler that, Believe it or not, I photographed while drinking coffee 
and eating tiramisu in Costa Rica because they <laughs> That's had, so great. Yeah, they had a setup in their backyard where they were coming to eat papaya and I, I had no idea that wobblers did that. And there was a guy there that apparently on their wintering grounds they will do so. It's only when they come up north is they become surely insectivorous, but over there and this maybe I don't know if all species do it, but this Tennessee wobbler was definitely coming in and all you had to do was sit up and shoot this guy. That's so great. You know, Louisiana water thrush. Uh, you got to know the species, know your species. Uh, if you can find them on breeding grounds, uh, water thrush require are basically, you know, next to water. We saw this guy foraging, going up and down, and uh, we put up a log and we came back and see if this guy's going to hop on it. And behold, he hopped on it for a few minutes. I nice. A picture, we moved on. Again, knowing your species, knowing the area. Uh, this one, uh, this is actually in my backyard. Uh, we, I always have a nesting yellow wobbler. I can't find the nest, but it's always there. He comes every year, and he loves this uh, dogwood, I believe it is. Yeah. And but every time I got close to this bird, he would fly away. And you know, then it, finally for this image, I actually set up one early morning sat in a blind for, I don't know, I think what time, whatever time sunrise is in May, and I waited for this guy, and he finally showed up. Nice. You know, soon after sunrise, and I was able to get a shot uh, with a 400 millimeter lens full frame and do that. So again, blind help a lot. That, that uh, is an amazing picture. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that really is. Oh, and yeah, that's amazing. Scott, I know you wanted to mention something with uh, perch birds about um, kind of vertical perspective. So if you want to hit on that while uh, Karam's got yeah, some that, of these it, images it, up. It was really actually similar to what Karam was talking about with the iguanas. A lot of people ask about, you know, eye level images of songbirds. And the one thing I, I just always advise is um, I, I'm fortunate to have a ridge near here. So I shoot a lot along that ridge. And just finding elevation with trees growing up. So the same way that Kern was describing, you know, the trees are 50 feet or 100 feet below. In this case, the trees are growing up 20 or 30 feet below me. Um, but getting toward the top of those branches, it gives you a lot better perspective. You will actually get birds above and below. So actually, the the image that you've got up now of that golden wing, it looks like you're actually a little bit above it, Kern. Yeah. And um, you yeah. can definitely get those looks. I shoot a lot from the car. Just I've got a couple spots along roads that just have elevation and nice drop-offs, and I know the time of day to shoot them where the where I'm going to get a little light, or I go there on overcast days, and um, and it it really works well. And, and then, look, that's a great point, uh, great point, and you you get the nice background that way. And, and this is actually shot at an angle, shooting down kind of into a ditch or a depression or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, and we were at a higher level, definitely. And you know, again, people believe that every wobbler shot that's out there is a setup. No, it's not. This is purely natural you know this was not a setup it just happened to be there so once in a while and again I use a car uh, you know I'm shooting out the window it kind of blocks your uh, outline and everything and shooting down uh, know where the birds are gonna be what kind of habitat they like you can actually get natural behavior certainly and you know for everyone listening the common theme here that is kind of runs across all of these shots, no matter what you're photographing, mammals, birds, is know your species. You know, learn the behavior, spend time out there learning their habitat, learn what they like to eat. All of this is probably the most important thing to be able to approach and get close to the target wildlife. Um, you know, oh. everybody in your first couple of years of wildlife photography, the general, um, method of going out is you pick a spot and you just kind of go out and wander around see what you're going to get uh and while you can get lucky occasionally and sometimes even often uh when you really want to start you know creating more consistent and more interesting wildlife photos you start planning you start thinking you start researching and uh that is kind of the biggest thing that allows us all to approach the different wildlife that we like to photograph is uh, it's a lot of research. It's a lot of planning and, um, you know, uh, just really learning about these different species. So that kind of just goes across the board there. So I just want to drop that in there. Uh, again, uh, you know, the, I mentioned originally uh, that uh, initially that, you know, you can have some species come to you. This was a setup. This was 
uh, you know, the perch was set up. Uh, there was fruit at the bottom, uh, and these kiskadees were coming in, you know, in big numbers. And Perfect. you sit there, you photograph them with, with a 400 millimeter, you know, and it works very well. And you can get close. I, I threw this image out there uh, just to illustrate that point that you can get filling images. Certainly. Um, Tracy asks, when shooting from a car, do you use a beanbag or other support? Uh, I personally do not. Do you, Karam? I don't. I used to. I started out like that. I have since stopped you. I thought it, uh, you know, if I had to ban, if something flew, I, I would lose the shot. So, you know, for now, I can, uh, I think I'm not old enough to handhold a 600. So once I guess I get to that point that I can't hold yeah. it. I may start using one, but for now, I, I handhold mine. How about you, Scott? No, I've, I've seen some window mounts and stuff that people use that look pretty cool, but um, no, I just, I use the window. Same here. I raise and lower the window yep, a little bit to exactly. get a better angle, but I just tilt it on the window. It lo it works like a pivot point. So yeah, totally. Yeah, I usually I just really throw the rubber, uh, like the rubber part of the lens on that window and just use that as a rest. It works pretty good. Yeah, I have a lens coat on mine, so I just kind of use that, that lens coat to, to lean on. Oh, the there you go, yeah. I'm the oddball that doesn't use those. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do you got with this nut hatch here? How'd yeah, this happen? Another example, basically, of the same thing. You know, uh, you if you try to run after a nut hatch, chances of you getting an image are next to none. Uh, and uh, this is the same thing. You know, you set up uh, food for them. Uh, this actually whole perch is set up. I have a pre, you know, my, my wife hates this. Uh, I have this whole pre cut out <laughs> like a log that I for woodpeckers and for nut hatches in the backyard, especially during the fall, and I'll just put some food out and these birds will come in. That's perfect. And this is shot from my deck, you know, probably with my son pulling on my pajamas. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, utilize your areas. It's easy. You can have birds coming close to you. Uh, it's, you know, I have a lot, lots of friends uh, who do that very well. You know, I have a friend in South Jersey. Uh, he has extensive... Uh, feeders and the kind of birds that move in from his backyard are astounding like you know it's amazing people we i go all these to these places to photograph these birds yeah and he shoots out of his uh backyard and he has a good great setup nice um, i'm gonna hop over to my screen real quick and hit some of those same backyard uh, things real quick same exact setup uh karam was talking about um you set up a natural area and put feed near it and the birds are going to land on the natural stuff as well so all these were taken right across the street from where i live um and just had some seed right in the area and they just kind of hop in there. So back to you, Carl. Yeah. I like the colors on that chickadee. Yeah. Uh, again, same thing. Uh, you know, uh, know the habitat. Uh, there's a field close to my house where you get these thistles. So, you know, during the fall, uh, you're going to get goldfinches there. And again, uh, you know, you get there, uh, you can, I, I literally use the plants and, and run close to me to kind of give me a camouflage and I set up my, you know, tripod at the land where I can just barely shoot over them. And, you know, and, and I actually kind of, I, I like it because it creates that warbler. So, you know, again, you don't have to get too close. Uh, maybe this is, you know, it's not close enough for some people, but, you know, as I'm progressing as a photographer, I'm moving away from getting too close to the subjects. When I first started, one of the first guys I shot with it's a good friend of mine, Dan, and you know the first thing he told me was a better picture is one where you create uh, more space. Uh, I, I don't know if Dan's watching; he's on call uh, this weekend. But uh, <laughs> he's, you know, he the first thing he taught me, and then you know, despite of what he taught me, my inclination was to get close to the birds, and it took me a while to understand that that is not the case. Same and here. Ray does that well too, you know. And now I've started making an effort, cons you know, conscious effort to actually move away. Yeah, totally. Uh, Scott wants to hit a question up real quick. Uh, Scott, yeah, there was just okay. a, the, yeah, yeah, there was a, a point mentioned about heat um, haze. It's it's a, a definitely a real thing. Um, I can almost tell when somebody shares a picture that they shot it out of their car window or through. The, some people like crack their door open in their home and try to sneak the camera through. The same yeah. thing's gonna happen. Yeah. Um, Mark Mark drives with me sometimes. And I start prepping the car like halfway down. I start rolling down the windows and it's 20 degrees. I know he's pissed, but <laughs> you know, I just, I know that that is a real thing and it's going to affect the shots um, when, when we get to the place we're going. So yeah, in the winter, I actually, I bundle up and I leave all the windows um, on. So there's like a draft going through the car 
it, just to try to balance it out. And then the heat haze off your hood, um, just be careful because even if you turn the engine off and you decide to use the backside of your car as a blind and you shoot over the car, you'll get that from the engine, just the, the heat from the engine. Yep. Um, of course, you'll get it on the ground if you're doing low angle photography. So it's a very real thing. So don't always assume your camera's not calibrated and your lens isn't right. If you're shooting in, in the cold, uh, especially, I notice it more in the winter. Yeah. But as, if you're in the summer and there's a heat haze coming off of a hot ground, um, you'll get it as well. Yeah, for sure. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. And actually, you know, the same thing happens when you're out shooting birds in the, in the spring and the summer. You know, the tendency is for us to jack up the air conditioning in the car. Correct. And when we get to our spots, these they're humid. And the next thing you know, you're going to have to wait half an hour trying to wipe off uh, yeah. the condensation <laughs> of the front element. Yeah, that as so, well. You know, so different, different theory, but does, it does the same thing. And you almost, I've actually had that to a point where I ended up losing the morning light. Oh time, yeah, like, shoot, the light was because there's gone. nothing you can do but just wait. So, yeah. Yeah. and sometimes you know, uh, it, with this image, uh, it's good to get close. Uh, yeah. If you know the, if you know them on territory, you can create a different kind of uh, uh, an image. You know, not every image needs to be side profile. Not every image needs to be looking at you. Uh, but as you grow as a photographer, you will realize different angles work. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, I think it's a Pacific uh, golden plover, not a Pacific American golden American, plover. American, yeah. On, yeah, on territory. So it was pretty tolerant. Uh, again, you know, most of the shots, these are shots with uh, teleconverters uh, with a 600 millimeter lens. Uh, same thing here. Uh, you know, we waited, we wanted this guy to come up. Uh, it wouldn't come up. Uh, you know, we, we had created a mound uh, for him to come to, and eventually we had to wait light kind of got sucky but he did show up uh and you know these are animals you can make or birds you can make them come to you i, I wouldn't necessarily make an animal come to me unless i'm in some sort of a blind but for birds you can do that yeah you know you can make you know make them come to you um uh, were you in a blind for those uh previous two uh short yes, bird shots both of them, both of them? Yeah. okay yeah. perfect yeah and this is a classic example of the heat haze um yeah. principle uh you know i i Put that there. Uh, know your birds. Again, the female, uh, you know, is moving away, and the male is looking back. But the image is soft, and the reason it's soft is because I was very low to the ground, and it was a warm day in the Arctic. There was ice on the ground, and it was all moisture with the haze coming off. Uh, same principle as you know, you as Scott was just talking about a few moments ago. Uh, this image, blind, blind, blind. Uh, this is a nest of a loon we found. Uh, we got into a blind. Uh, the birds, it was it was a warm day, as I said, and these birds were going off and on, especially when they were changing position, so they would leave the nest unguarded. And we set up a blind, and we got into one, and we waited for 35 minutes uh, for the birds to come back. Uh, and, you know, we were basically... We, we photographed them and then we crawled out of the blinds and we moved away and we were able to get that the, i had this image in mind that when the loon every time a loon comes it'll flip the uh, egg over and i wanted that image when it's flipping the egg over and that that was a good experience so yeah it's all about knowing the behavior there yeah. another question for and, you oh go ahead no and, and and the fact that we were in a blind rig yeah definitely definitely yeah. um Pete asks, uh, what are your thoughts on flash photography for birds and wildlife? Do you use exclusively natural light, or do you mess with the flash at all? Yes, I do mess with the flash. I have done uh, flash. Flash, you know, so why do you want to use flash? You want to use flash when there's not enough ambient light. Because let, let's be honest, you know, the flash doesn't uh, replace a nice golden hour light. Flashes are not that appealing. You use them when you don't have enough light. To bring out the shutter speed to get that little catch eye for the most part we do it with songbirds and i've done it with songbirds with mammals you know i, I, I tend not to use them uh uh with you know with other birds i've not used them up you know ducks i barely want them to know that i'm there so i've never used them so the only species that i've personally shot flash with are songbirds and, and you will realize very soon whether the individual that you're working with does or does not like flash. 
uh, you know, I have a friend who doesn't believe in it who shoots without flash. Uh, and, you know, and I understand his perspective. And no doubt, you know, and he's right about what he's saying. So, again, you know, that's that's your... It's a little bit uh, personal thing. preference there, yeah. But for generally, it works well for, for the most people who use who photograph wobblers would agree that for wobblers, it is required more often than not. Yeah. Uh, just a heads up, Karam, we got about uh, 10, 15 minutes left. So uh, we'll just, yeah. just want to make sure you hit the images that you wanted to hit on this one. Yeah, I'm going to move forward. Again, same thing. Don't worry about getting in the water. Uh, I think Scott mentioned about using waders. Get into the water. Uh, these birds basically will... Once you get into the water, they will approach. For some reason, you're not much of a predator to it them. It really does change their behavior, I agree. Yeah, so, you know, this this is almost full frame, a balloon, and we were in the water. And that helped. Uh, shorebird, you know, you can run after them. Yeah. Uh, they're likely going to run away. But most of the uh, shorebirds will, if they're working in an area of the beach, even if they go away from you, they will come back. So it's easy to set up in that particular area and wait for them, uh, you know, to come back. And this is the oyster catcher who was, you know, he would take the muscle, take it back to the uh, baby and then come back and go from there. Yeah, that's uh, a perfect point about shorebirds, definitely. Uh, stilts, you know, they, they breed here. Uh, everybody knows uh, up in Bombay, they normally breed in a small swamp if you know them, you know, they will fly off the swamp uh, from that little island because, you know, it's all surrounded by water. So you sit there in a car uh, using that as a blind, get close, and the birds eventually forget about you and they'll do their natural behavior and they can't swim. So they have to, you know, fly off the island and you can get your shots. Uh, same thing with shorebirds, get into the water, uh, get low, uh, crawling. You have to crawl for shorebirds. Not every bird you can walk up to. Shorebirds are a prime example of that. Crawling, crawling, crawling. This required a lot of crawling. Uh, and you can get close to and create compositions that you want to. Uh, same thing. I was with Josh, uh, another friend of ours, for this. And, you know, we crawled for maybe half a mile to get yep. in position with these guys. Uh, and we eventually got closer than this. And... You know, initially we we had a very hard time getting close to them, but we crawled, we took our time. That half a mile maybe took us, I don't know, maybe an hour, felt like longer. But finally, when we got into position, these guys couldn't care less after a while. Uh, get into the water, use waders, get into the water. Uh, you know, this was the same thing. Uh, we waded into the water, we found a place where uh, the Vimbrels were nesting. And, you know, it, it was, uh, I came back, I ripped my waders, I had a one leg full of water, <laughs> but you know, I never photographed Vimbrels before, yeah. so that was fun. Yep. Uh, Again, see. Nice. So, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, 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 no, sorry. Just pointing yeah, out. Yeah, really you like know, know your shorebirds. If they are on breeding grounds, you know, when you, if you go up north, you're not going to find shorebirds because we sh shoot shorebirds locally when they're migrating through. When you go up north, they're away from the water, so you're going to find them on dry land. Get low, uh, crawl up to them, and, and they will come and you know do their displays from the mounds that they use uh, and stuff like that. That's generally what it is. You can sometimes get this close yeah. uh, to birds, and it's when you've shot. And this, again, this was a little place. Uh, we were just, you know, I probably didn't move the whole morning, and the birds came to me for this one. You know, let them do their thing, and they were just going back and forth, and calling and displaying. Yep. It was at the start of the breeding season, and generally you can do that very well. Uh, again, uh, moving on to some raptors. I want to hit a pause uh, real quick before you hit uh, sure. the different topic. There's a couple of questions, and then I just want to go over some more stuff with shorebirds real quick. Uh, Ray Gudetti asks about getting in the water for the first time. How do you go about doing that? And a few commenters suggested some great things. I think, um, okay. you know, get yourself some waders and get in the water without equipment first. Just get used to being in there. Yeah. Um, Scott also just mentioned definitely know the different bodies of water that you're going to go in. Uh, some um, bottoms can be more rocky and sturdy and you can walk on them. Uh, some of these lake bottoms that I've been in have been nothing but muck that go up to almost your waist. Uh, so you just have to be prepared for the type of 
um, you know, uh, bottom surface that you're going to be getting into. So yeah, I would I would say definitely uh, first off have your gear insured. Uh, secondly, practice going in the water without the gear, and then third, go in and just take your time. There's usually no hurry. Uh, you're just going to be getting in and sitting in one spot for a long time. So take your time, make sure everything is safe. And uh, once you do it a few times, it actually really isn't that big a deal. Um, yeah, and, and if you're in lakes and stuff like that, the water's going to be pretty calm. Yep. Just if you're going into tidal areas, be very aware. Yes. You can go out into an area, yep. and then all of a sudden you can't get back in. Yeah, for sure. Um, so just be very careful in tidal areas. And, and I would... Like when I shoot um, along the shore, I'm generally shooting with Ray because, you know, you you don't want to get out there and get stuck somewhere. Um, you know, we've had some some experiences. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and then going back to all the stuff that uh, Karam was just talking about with shorebirds and, um, you know, the the stalking method. So a lot of shorebirds you can uh, stalk them, but the key with stalking all of these birds that are on the ground is stay low, stay as low as possible. So a lot of that a lot of the times that means laying on your stomach and just slowly crawling along, moving just inches at a time, making sure you're not getting up uh, high or moving too quick, and you can almost always uh, close the gap. Um, and usually a lot of shorebirds kind of have a general area that they're feeding in, and you can kind of make these close, close approaches, uh, as in some of the images I'm showing right now, as well as some of the ones that Karam was just showing. And the same thing goes with wading birds sometimes. So uh, all of these images, I actually stalked in on the bird um, as they were just kind of hanging out in a particular area. So uh, back to your Harrier now. Yeah, so we'll move on to a bunch of great shots, right? Um, so let's move on to raptors, uh, Harriers. Harry, you can shoot photograph Harriers uh, by just standing on the side of a field. Uh, you know, most of the chances are, you know, they'll fly towards you and at the very last moment they'll turn away. That's a common scenario, but you know, sometimes they do get close. Uh, if you're in a camo, helps. If you're in a blind, helps. Uh, I've shot Harriers from the side of uh, the road sitting in my car. And this was actually in a blind where he came and sat. Uh, unfortunately, the light was almost gone. Yeah. Uh, used blind. Oh, uh, nice. Same thing. Yeah, same thing here with this kestrel. He was uh, sitting, and I was able to slowly walk up to him. Uh, you know, I was not in a blind. Uh, I, I didn't have a choice. I was just standing out in the open, and I saw him perch behind me, and I kind of walked up to this guy, and he let me get close enough. Uh, if you're going to stalk up to anything, slow, slow, slow. For Take sure. Your time. You know, uh, if you walk fast, you're likely going to end up spooking the bird anyhow. Yep. Yeah, and one thing on both um, kestrels, and it's a it's a common thing with kingbirds. Somebody actually asked me how to photograph kestrels. You you have to know their perches. They they will hunt from the same perches over and over again, and they'll return to the same perches. So if you kind of know where those are and you've got a good vantage point, you can probably set up either in a car or find a blind or you know kind of protect yourself. They're super skittish, a lot like kingfishers. They're they're going to fly if they see movement. So um. But kingfishers are the same way. They have favorite perches, and if you can find where they are, uh, you can get some unbelievable pictures. But if you think you're going to walk up to a kestrel or a kingfisher and just start snapping pictures, it's not going to happen. Yeah, no, that's true. That, that that was a pure accident. You know, I never saw that bird again. Never got that shot again. Yeah, rub it in. I'm throwing yeah. up a couple of kingfishers right now, <laughs> and these were all from in a blind. Uh, I spent um, many, many hours just sitting around and waiting for these guys. But uh, blind definitely works if you know the area that they're going to come to. All right, so what's that awesome condor? Yep. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, so uh, this is actually a king vulture, and basically what you have to find out is uh, where, so up in the mountains of Costa Rica, when an animal dies, they don't take it away, they don't bury it, they kind of just leave it there, uh, especially because they can't verify whether it has disease or not, so they leave it out there. And the vultures will come to it, and you have to find out where these animals are. Generally, you know, if you know the locals, they'll let you know, and you go to them, and you can find your king vultures, and you know, set up stuff for. They usually, in the, you know, you have trees and branches, and you can photograph them, keep a distance because it smells. Uh, again, you know, knowing your animals, knowing your birds, where to find them, uh, helping. Like you know, they mentioned earlier, lo speaking to somebody local who knows the animal always helps. Uh, you know, sometimes you just have to hide. I mean, this is, you know, a picture of a shorty at owl. I recently photographed, I was able to walk up to it. 
uh, using the fence that I was sitting in, literally crouching underneath the fence. And at the last moment, you know, I knew what I wanted. I got up and I photographed them. This was at, with a 600 millimeter with a 2x silicon motor. And I was able to get this guy. And then after a while, I just crept down and walked away. And I actually left them there, you know, because I wasn't, uh, other than flushing the word, I wasn't going to create more compositions anyhow. And yeah. if he flew, I didn't have enough light to get any picture anyhow. Uh, you know, shooting get low shooting from a car you know I photographed this snowy owl in the morning uh, a few months ago uh, basically looking out the you know shooting out of my car window that's awesome and I was able to you know we were at an incline uh, you guys know the area so you know you, even if you're shooting at your car window you're kind of shooting at eye level with yeah. the bird we eventually did come out and shoot him from the ground so that was pretty good and you know you were kind of hidden initially I thought at this when this happened he was paying attention to me, but there was actually another bird behind us. That's what he was worried about. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. Same thing, shooting out, you know, using a blind. Uh, this was, this bird was, you know, further away. Uh, he obviously knew we were there, but to him, you know, the human airplane wasn't there. So they're, you know, much better off soon after this, you know, he just, got back uh, off the perch, hunkered down, and that was the end of that. Yep. Uh, you know, same thing. I mean, we were, this bird, uh, we we were in the car, so we missed him coming out of the tree uh, trying to hunt. And, uh, you know, but, but when he took, it was a failed hunt, and when he took off, I was at least ready by then because I knew where he was. So I was able to get the, him getting back to his perch after a failed hunting, uh, you know, thing. Would I, would I set up a blind for these guys? No, not necessarily. Uh, you know, great gray owls are very tolerant to human, you know, been around humans for the most part. And uh, so they'll hunt close to you. We were in the car because it was freaking cold that day. Uh, nice. It was like um, 30 degrees. So we were just getting there warm, you know, getting some coffee and getting warm again. And then he decided that he's going to fly at that very instant. Uh, you know, my favorite owl, the great horn. Uh, I know of this area where they nest or used to nest. And, you know, you set up uh, a blind there. And just before dark, these birds will get active and the male will fly in uh, to where the nest was. And, you know, you would just have to be ready. Uh, you know, and I, I wasn't able to bring up any decent shutter speed. This was with ISO 4000, one four hundredth of a second. Again, shot from the blind. Yeah, the wingtip blur well, on that is perfect, though. Yeah, yeah, it worked out well on this one. And, you know, and if you get this shot... Uh, do you mind just means... one second? I'm going to put you on hold on that one. Uh, I want you to wrap it up with the story on that last one, actually. A um, uh, couple of questions. Uh, Elizabeth asks, are you on your stomach in the water on the edge, or... Um, are we getting into the water a little bit deeper and sitting? Uh, Elizabeth, for years before I was getting in the water, it was just laying prone along the edge of the water, just like you thought. Uh, but lately, with the waders and everything, um, I've actually been getting in the water so I can sit. And uh, the reasons are twofold. Number one, uh, it seems to make the birds less scared of you, so um, getting closer approaches. And number two, it's a lot more comfortable actually just sitting there than it is laying prone and shooting with your neck kind of bent up and everything. It gets really uncomfortable really fast. So um, you know, those are kind of the two main reasons uh, as well. And, and then the last one would be uh, you can get in some different areas. Uh, some shorelines don't really have a good spot to lay down along the edge, whereas if you can get in the water, you can just kind of go anywhere you want. So uh, that answers those. And I do just want to mention just a few overview points here about everything we kind of talked about. Um, you know, shorebirds are great for either finding an area and waiting for them to come to you, or you can do some slow crawling and uh, stalking them just by belly crawling or just moving really slow. Uh, they really do not require camouflage, so you kind of don't have to hide from them too much. It's just a slow, low approach works great for those. Uh, with the perch birds, use your cars for... Uh, cover if you want sometimes that works really great definitely think about the vertical perspective and using elevation to get eye level um, some species just require waiting you know that's going to be part of it uh, and you need to get camo so waterfowl are definitely in that um, 
that grouping, uh, kingfishers, and a few other species that we talked about already. And, you know, uh, waiting and sitting in a blind can be incredibly boring for hours on end, and then all of a sudden you just have some great action and you get some amazing photos. So it can definitely be worth it, but just don't always count on getting the shot. Sometimes you don't. And, um, you know, with the mammals and everything, especially with the deer, the, all the different deer species we talked about, and, uh, is, and then what Karam's going to talk about at the end here, uh, go during the rut. That's probably your best chance of getting really good interaction with uh, the males chasing the females, uh, interacting with each other, and allowing you to kind of move around a little bit more free without having them so worried about you because they're really concerned with mating at that time. And then the last thing is sometimes you can find, look for different areas locally that have habituated wildlife. So, um, you know, uh, there's a, a rookery in southern New Jersey where uh, hundreds or thousands of wading birds uh, nest every year, and you can just kind of go and photograph them. That's a great area. Uh, some foxes in different areas get habituated to people. Some deer actually get habituated to people. Uh, there's places where ducks are fed that you can go and find. So, you know, talk to people, make friends, look for these areas. They can be great places to go uh, and just get some of these close experiences. So uh, those are kind of all the different things we wanted to talk about uh, with different ways of approaching wildlife. And then I'm going to let Karam kind of wrap it up with this one last story of this moose encounter he had, which is a really interesting one. Uh, yeah, Ray, I couldn't, uh, you know, wrap that up uh, nicely. Uh, I think you're touching all the points. And we were talking about, you know, the whole topic was how to approach wildlife. If you get this shot, you did it wrong. Because you got too close and you're getting charged. Uh, I think somebody asked whether I've gotten charged. This is a prime example of it. Uh, call it stupid. I don't know why I clicked the shutter. But this was the only shot I got. And uh, decided to climb a tree. But then stop and he walked away and uh, wow so you know this is not fun uh this is like you know and you really don't care about your gear at that point you just want to get out of this and this was one of those where i did get too close to this animal so you know happy shooting uh take your time uh like ray said close is not always uh, better and keep a safe distance definitely i hope you guys enjoyed tonight's uh talk with uh, ray me and scott Yes. Have a good evening, guys. Certainly. Thank you so much, Karam. Uh, Scott, anything else you wanted to add? No, you guys did a great job. I always love looking at uh, Karam's stuff. I, I will tell you that, um, you know, a couple years ago when I started getting more serious about it, Karam was one of the guys that I just always thought was was ahead of everybody else. Same here, he man. Doing. Um, so it's it's really a privilege to, to just be just hang out with you guys. So yeah, yeah to hang out, to listen to you, and hear some of the thoughts behind these images is definitely great. Uh, yep. I know from being friends with Karam that he's one of the the people that definitely puts a lot more thought into the creation of his wildlife photography, and that is uh, one of the things we'll probably be coming up in a near future topic as well. So uh, thank you everybody for watching. Thank you guys both for joining me tonight for this talk and uh, for everyone out there. Stay tuned probably within the next week or so. Uh, we're definitely going to have another talk and uh, have some fun with that one. So uh, take it easy, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.